Today, Maximiliano Uloa York joins us and he shares his story of resilience after suffering a significant injury. Max also talks about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and how it significantly helped his recovery. Max is an incredible interview with a lot of good insight, so tune in. Through that tragedy, it taught me life is finite. You really have a short window to like take what it is from life that you want and enjoy it. If you can go back to that day, February 18, 1990, and change what happened, my my honest answer is I, I wouldn't change it. You're just going to have to go through it, and your strength is going to be found in simply going through it and being authentic and real in the process. I was talking with my buddy, the care doctor today, and she, she turned around to me and she looked at me and she was like, do you think that you'll eventually be beat this? And I was sort of like, yeah, that's probably what I'm trying to do. No, nothing will ever take away the pain of my daughter not being here. It's my reality. Well, I know what my body's going to do to me. I've got a wheelchair in my future. But you know what I've been looking for? What's that? One with off-road the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Just remembering me as I am, happy and energetic and full of life, no matter what. You can expect a life to kick you in the teeth, but you always get back up, no matter what, and you just keep going. Living Adaptive with Scott Davidson. What's up, everybody? Welcome back. We have a really good episode today. We're going back to our roots, and we're doing what we do best, and that's sharing stories. Today, I'm joined by Maximiliano Uloa York. Max is a BJJ instructor, BJJ competitor, and runs the International Jiu-Jitsu Without Limitations Federation and also the Para Jiu-Jitsu Magazine. Max is an important figure in the world of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and he's especially an important figure in the world of adaptive Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It's an honor to have Max on today. Thanks for coming on, man. Hey, man. Hey, Scott. How's it going over there? Good, man. It's been really good over here. Glad to have you on, man. It's a real honor because I'm a huge fan of what you do, a huge fan of the sport you're involved in, and I'm just happy to have you here. So I want to jump right into this. You like choking people for a living. Man, you like submitting people. Your game is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. You're involved in a bunch of organizations, as we listed in the introduction. What year did you start jumping into this? Because this happened before your accident. Yes, I started in 2009. I was going through a divorce, and I had the I had the understanding of myself that if if I didn't go and do something, I would probably end up you know, being sad at home in a bottle or something. So I just got my bonus for the end of the year. I went to the uh, jujitsu um, academy. I dropped three grand down for private lessons because I knew I would have to go at that point. Um, then I spent the next three years training. I got my blue belt. Um, and then I ended up falling in 2012. Well then, so you're in jujitsu. You already know the art and you have an accident, man. You have a significant accident. You've talked about this before in other interviews, and you you air it out on your site. You air it out in your social media. What happened, man? Um, you know, I, I believe in in letting people know because a lot. Of, unfortunately, I, I got the feeling because it was hard to find stories or find stuff uh, when I fell. Just find things that would help me. So. I think it's important to let people know more about what it's like being in a in a spinal cord injury. So I, I try to give as much information as I can. I don't really care too much about privacy and stuff. I think it, if it helps somebody, it's more important. I was sitting on a balcony and um, uh, those Cinco de Mayo, we were all hanging out on the balcony. I was sitting on a pretty good significant ledge uh, in California and second floor. I was sitting in a lotus position. I lost my balance. I, I just fell over. I ended up landing on, on a, in, a seated, in a seated position on my butt, and the pressure just went up my spine and shattered my T5 vertebrae. What were you like uh, prior to this incident? What was life like prior? Because a lot changes. As soon as you fall, my understanding with your story, you knew. As soon as you fall, fell, within 10 minutes, you knew life was changed forever. What were you like before this? What was life like before it? Well, I, I'm the third child of four. So growing up in the 80s, early 90s, you we didn't have any like there wasn't any your feelings didn't matter as a child. No. You know? Yeah, you know, for sure. You, you go to your parents and you complain. You, you only complain a couple times. I remember it very clearly. My dad told me I went and said, my brother's hitting me. And um and he looked at me and said, don't tattletale on your brothers. 
So ever since that day, I knew that I was I was on my own. It wasn't. It's. I'm not saying this in a way of like, oh, well, it's me. I'm on my own. I had a rough childhood. Like I accept the times and I accept it today. I think um, my whole life I've been that. Uh, I've always had that understanding. Understanding that no matter what comes in my life. I have to deal with it because no one else is going to be there. Because my older brothers were, they're a few years older than me, so too old to hang out with with the little punk tag along. Yeah, and yeah. then my young, younger brother was was uh, five years younger than me, so he's too young for me to go hang out. So I really was always just trying to find things on my own. I was very adventurous. I was a, you know, we didn't have, they we had the Nintendo, of course, Atari, but they obviously the older brothers they they're gonna hog that you don't get a chance even if you're playing they're gonna boot you off of it. Yeah, so yeah. there was no memory cards back then remember yeah no no so it was pointless to get started so my my thing was always going outside playing with crawfish going through the creeks and just getting dirty really so i've always been an adventurous person i was living in california i got into rock climbing uh before jujitsu rock climbing well, first, my first love was cooking. I've, I've been cooking in my entire life, uh, studying the art of food. And then I got into rock climbing. That was my second love. And then jujitsu kind of, I don't, uh, jujitsu kind of took over all of those afterwards. But I was very adventurous and very, very much a loner, I would say. Uh, do you feel like your that kind of childhood had a big impact on where you steered yourself? Hmm. It's a good question. I, definitely, I would say when we got into more of our middle school and high school days, you really had to, I mean, you had to answer for whatever you said. You know, it wasn't nowadays where you get away with whatever you say. You had to answer for for your actions. And But I think I think the root of it all would definitely stem stem down to my, uh, my older brothers. You know, you're, yeah. you have older brothers picking on you. You know, my dad, he would spank us a little excessively at times. But um, so I, I wasn't allowed to cry in the beginning. So like if we got a spanking, you're not allowed to cry or, or it'll make things worse. So you kind of learned how to deal with pain in a sense. I know it sounds bad for all the listeners, but in my time, it was like it wasn't about trying to be tough or anything. It was more about. If I cried, I did. It would give my brothers the satisfaction that they got to me. So I'd rather take more of a beating than than to show any emotion because it would. It was my way of winning in, in my mind. You have a really kind of you approach some horrific stuff, some bloody stuff. You you like uh, laugh about it. You and like eight years before your first incident, you also had an incident where that led to you already adapting to something. You cut your leg open, man. What was that all about? Man, I, you know, <laughs> it's still, it's still, uh, I still chuckle about it today when I'm watching movies or <laughs> especially uh, action movies where someone gets a knife cut to their leg and then they can't, they're immobilized and they're screaming bloody murder. And I look at it like, that's so fake. Yeah. Because, <laughs> cause I put a skill salt through my leg and, um, and it was deep. It was good two inches by six inches wide. It was a pretty good, nice cut. I missed the artery about a, by a quarter inch, they told me. Well, we were uh, hanging out and talking the other day, and you're telling this story. I'm like, this is actually really funny how he's approaching it. Like, uh, it is a good story. It's like one of those good war stories, you know? I think, well, the funny part for me was uh, was Keith, Keith's, Keith's face. Uh, I had a worker with me and um, I was cutting a piece of wood, but the um, when the guard on the saw didn't come back, come that back down, my pants leg caught the blade on the wind down. And then when it pulled it into my leg, I pulled the trigger. It pulled away, it pulled it into my leg, but I was holding it firm. So I ended up pulling the trigger and made it go again. Um, <laughs> but I looked up at Keith and his face was white. He was so <laughs> horrible. Bike, man yeah it was hilarious to me because well at the time I, in, in that moment i was like oh wow this is um this is something bad because i heard the salt drop 
but I didn't know what had happened. I just was, my only reference was his face. So I, I, I realized, okay, this is something just went down. And I told him, clean up the tools because we're in the middle of DC building a deck and those tools won't be there if we come back. And, uh, I, I walked over to the truck and put a, uh, I grabbed a wood strap and, and started cranking it down on my leg just in case I hit something serious and, uh, waited for him. And he was just Frank, Frank, just running all over trying. It wasn't even a lot of tools. And I'm looking at him like, what's his <laughs> Like He didn't know what to grab first, the saw or go unplug the saw. He was just like, he was panicking for sure. Um, and then I, I was waiting for him to get in the car, in the truck. And when he jumped in, I like, I, I, I yelled like the F word real loud. And he was like, what happened? What happened? And I told him, uh, I just bought these shorts last week. And he's like, that's not funny. He started freaking out. Jeez. It was, you know, it wasn't, I didn't feel any pain though at, at all at that moment. I think I'm pretty sure there's something, especially it was, it was, um, it was uh, solidified when I fell off the balcony. Like my mind in the in the moment of of where you have to make quick decisions or something serious just happened, my mind cuts the world off and focuses. It even cuts emotion off until it's time. Did you know when you fell off the balcony? So we're now um, after so years after the saw event, you fall off the balcony as you're describing. You hit the ground, man. Did you know, how quickly did you know and how quickly did medical uh, personnel confirm that you were going to have a paralysis injury? You're going to have a spinal cord injury. Well, the well, first of all, when I hit, I, I saw a tree limb moving, but I couldn't move. I couldn't like get up. So I thought something was spinning me down. Uh, so when I reached down with both my hands to maybe push something off my lap or something off my chest because I couldn't even sit up mm -hmm. i ended up touching my own privates and i realized and i I've quickly pulled my hands back because it felt like i was touching someone else but then the 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 logic of the situation didn't make sense so i quickly realized like oh wow that's me and i can't feel my body um so i knew right then that something definitely just went wrong um and I, I told them, I said, no, yeah, because I because when they asked me, he said, whoa, you're right. And I was like, yeah, I'm fine. And then um, and then I after that, I told them, no, I'm not. I can't feel my legs or I can't feel my body. Um, and it, for me, it was it was I don't know. I'm pretty good at just judging the, the situation and and, um, and accepting it right away. And uh, but I didn't know what had happened, like as far as diagnosis goes until I was in the hospital, maybe five days later, because I, they had me basically, I, it, it's still all the fog. I remember waking up in a pitch black. It was so dark in that room, just the lights everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and I was, I had a morphine button in one hand and I had the, um, you know, the, the, the pulse reader they put on your finger and oh, the yeah, tape. Yeah. Yeah. That has a red light. When I saw that in that dark room, it was just of my red finger, and I made a video. It was probably three days after I made a video saying Elliot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Et's got to go home, right? It's, yeah. Uh, no, that's wild. How you approach? Like, it seems like, um, like you said, you're able to cut it off kind of get down to like what do i need to do to get to this next step or get through this next step to get onto what i you know onto a more uh better path maybe i don't know how to um clearly state that but what do i need to do how how much support did you have when this all went down like we're because you're in california at this point yeah it was it was even it was a rough road um from the beginning uh when when they said i had to go home first of all i didn't have any family in town and and unfortunately, you know, I'm sure a lot of the listeners can uh, can relate to this. But when something dramatic happens in your life, you know, the people you think are your friends, they are they have their own lives. You know what I mean? They can't drop everything to come and support you. Unfortunately, um, I it, it wasn't a, I didn't wasn't sad because I'm very accepting of of most things. 
but it was kind of disappointing that um, that it, I mean, ha- I probably all my my friends, even people I rolled with every single day, I just would get a Facebook get well or you know what I mean. It was kind of in a sense like, wow, I'm really on my own here because I had zero family. I had a really, I had a couple good friends. Vicky, uh, Vicky came in and didn't even ask me. She just said, "Where's your house keys so I can take care of your cat?" Like she's. She's a diehard friend for sure. But yeah, you're right. I, in fact, it's funny you say that. I was uh, I, there's somebody I follow on social media. You know, I've talked with before who went through a pretty significant spinal cord injury, uh, recovering from it. At this point, it's been several years now. And he made a post recently about you know a lot of people think I'm cool. I'm their motivation. You know, like I do a bunch of stuff. And everybody's excited to see it. And they're like, this is this look at, look at him. He's, he's crushing it. But then he's like a reality. I'm dying inside. I'm having so many difficulties. The music fades. I'm alone at times. And people need to understand that it's not all this social media. It's not this highlight you see in social media. Most of the time it's a struggle to get from here to there. And I was talking to all the other people that are involved in very large organizations that that is a big problem for a lot of very, very, very public figures, very known pi- figures in the um, that have gone through significant stuff is that there is a there's a feeling of almost aloneness at times while you're going through all of this. Yeah, well, I can I can relate to that as far as um, but but then again, it goes back to to my entire life. I've I've been that loner, that solo guy, you know, mm-hmm. so so I'm used to being like in my own world and and used to having to deal with my own problems on my own because I I never I would rather go through more pain or more discomfort than to ask for help even in this dramatic state like I didn't even ask my brother Thomas for I I knew that I needed somebody and I needed help and when I um I called my brother or when I finally talked to my brother a week after my fall, I didn't even ask him, but he was, he basically told me, he said, look, I ha- I'm on a job that's going to, he, he's, he, he's a huge deck builder. So he was mm-hmm. building a deck that was going to take two months. It, it had all these components to it and he had two months left on the job. And uh, he's like, I can't come. I can get off work and come there, pack up your, your place uh, into storage and then help you out whatever you want and then come back and help you into the apartment for a week but that's all I can do until two months and then he and then I can I can just pack everything and move to California like that I didn't even ask him he just knew that that's what you're supposed to do as a brother uh, and he's in the position to do it so at the beginning for two months after my um after after I went home I was in the rehab for two months, and then once I got to the, my job also was a huge um, help. The uh, HG Fenton, they they are just an amazing company. They really look after their employees. They they let it's an apartment complex. They own a bunch mm-hmm. of apartment complexes, so they gave me a a, a um, an apartment for free. They paid for my insurance for two months. They said, don't worry about anything. Just get better. And then you have to go on Cobra after two months. But they really fit the uh, uh, front of the bill for, for all that. And that was a huge help, especially since I didn't have any anybody in town. Um, my mom, unfortunately, she was even in she was in a hard spot, too, because she's a postmaster and um, she was in that month that I fell retiring and training her replacement. So she couldn't even leave either. Um, so everybody was on the East coast and I was over in California by myself. Yeah. Only 2000, like 300 miles away from everybody. It's nuts, man. You were on your own the whole time. Um, it was rough. I had the, I had the, um, to give you an insight on how rough it was is I, I didn't have the strength to cook, anything more than ramen noodles and or make cereal so the maintenance guy the porter of the property i was staying at he um he would come bring me noodles cereal and milk and take my clothes out of the dryer because i I couldn't reach that high it was a stackable 
and um, and take my trash out. And then he said, I'll see you in a couple of days. And, and that's how it was for two months. I was just sitting there. Everything that I physically, all my strength that I got in those two months in rehab when, was just going down, dwindling, 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 because I was basically stuck in a bed for two months. I didn't even have a proper ramp on the house. So when it came to rehab, it seems like it, there was not there there was not enough support there. You get back to the house, you didn't have enough appointments to get in to maintain the gains you had afterwards. How much was lost, and how much did you gain back over time when you could finally um, get into the right position where you could rehabilitate? You know, honestly, I still haven't gotten there yet. Mm-hmm. To be honest, there's people with my same injury that are doing way better than I am. I guarantee you. And the reason is because my own uh, the insurance was only giving me one one physical therapy a week. So whatever I learned this week, I, I lost it all before I can get to the next one. So it was pointless. And I had to make a decision. I just stopped going back to physical therapy because it was more painful to get there than to than what I was gaining from it. Mm-hmm. And um, and at that point, I, I, I think about six months after Six to eight months after I I decided to, I made the, the decision to go back to um to the jujitsu mats because um because I know how it fixed my my leg that we talked about earlier when I started I had a limp uh, six months into jujitsu I was running up mountains with no problem and zero limp so I knew how it fixed and helped me then um, three years ago so I knew it was going to do the same thing for this I, I I have no doubt that jiu-jitsu with the it's all about leverage and um uh that was gonna that was my only steady physical therapy I went back uh uh to my first to my academy but it was so far away it was it was it was hard uh to get there um so I ended up going to my first academy which was closer and and then I would just um, I mean, I look at back at the footage like, wow, I was so slow. I couldn't move a lot. And um, so I spent a lot of time on the mats because when I was on the mats and occupied with choking someone or getting or defending a choke or an arm bar, you it's a distraction from the pain. Like we're in pain constantly. So but when your mind is occupied, you don't feel that pain. So the more that you're naturally going to want to do that more than anything else because it's a release from that 24 hour stabbing you're a different type of human i'm sorry it's true though you picked prior to accident prior to multiple accidents but prior to accident you picked i want to learn how to submit a person i want to learn how to submit another human being i i like i like to get down on the mats i like to you know, choke somebody. I like to be able to do that kind of stuff. And that's a different mindset. It really is. A lot of people choose basketball, choose football, choose tennis, whatever. You chose jujitsu. So your mindset was already pretty damn tough. You know what I mean? But who is the most integral person in the jujitsu community to start assisting you and start figuring this out? Uh, as far as when I, after my injury or yeah, after your injury, uh, I went back to, um, uh... To my academy with uh, Leticia and and Fabricio Camoys, uh, Leticia Ibero, and um, I I went in there and was like, "What's up? What do you guys think? Like, what's the deal?" And they're both. I mean, it's obviously something new to everybody, even to myself, even with the three years knowledge. Um, and it was really like I don't know. At the time, I was kind of a kind of I wasn't upset. I never get upset, but I was kind of frustrated because I wanted to learn techniques and the reality was I mean they did the right thing they were saying like go go over there and do exercises you you need to build your body up more than trying to learn how to submit someone um so at the time it was more like I wanted to get back into my old routine of learning techniques and going, but I couldn't do anything that they're showing in class because it, you know, they're, you need your bot, you need your full body. Uh, so what happened was it really ended up being where I would get some instruction from, from them because I went back to them and then, like I said, I had to go back to the closer Academy. And then I was, so I was getting help from all my instructors that I've I've had up to that time. 
But what it came down to was really just me translating what I already knew the three years prior into a new body. And what it, what the, what happened was, is I had to, like they, like they ref, uh, suggested in the first place, is I had to rebuild my entire body again for jujitsu all over again. So I had a, I had a blue belt and a three year jujitsu mindset, but in a less than a white belt body again. So it took a long time to, uh, to, to get to the point where I'd, I'd say up to about two years ago. So it took a good five years just to get my body to, to, um, catch up with my skill in my mind, especially since every year I, my skill in my mind kept getting better and better, but my body was slowly building. Uh, but it, it took, a, um, it took a long time. Now you didn't just, you didn't just hop back into jujitsu. You didn't, and that's Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You didn't just hop right back into there. You actually went out and started creating things. You started the Jiu-Jitsu Without Limitations Federation. And on top of that, you started your own little media company, the Para Jiu-Jitsu Magazine. And you started to bring adaptive Jiu-Jitsu to the world. What finally got you to take that step and be like, I'm going to share this with the world? I wish I could say that initially it was based off of a, um, of, off of like a good, a great idea, but what it, what had happened was I, this, I started writing the, the, I knew that physically I was going to be out for a while. So I started writing the idea, the rules, the everything that I wanted people to benefit from when I was actually in the hospital, because if, you know, it was an idea, but it wasn't ideas that was based off of irritation and frustration that I could not find anything on the web to help me in the next years to come. Like I had no idea what to expect from a spinal cord injury. Right. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know if I'm going to get movement back because you can't talk to anybody you can't say oh you have a spinal cord injury tell me about it and then okay good i'm gonna be like that and then everyone's completely different and um and I, I mean i didn't know until years later that how severe my mobility uh issues were compared to other people so i i got frustrated and i said you know what there everything out here there was there was the everyone wanted money in order to help you out. And it drove me nuts that 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 it's it was driven by that. So I made a point to I wanted to create something that is more than just competition, because all your jujitsu federations out there, they're they primarily only focus on competition and they're, they're money makers um, because people pay to go to compete. Um, but I wanted more, something more than just a com competition um, federation. I wanted to, I, ha I call it, uh, so the, I call it without limitations because I wanted to create a exploring without limitations, cooking without limitations, jujitsu without limitations, chess without limitations for those with, um, with uh, more severe uh, paralysis. Um, and, um, uh, and the reason is because basically everything that I did in my life, thinking that I couldn't do it again because this happened was it just didn't. It's it's not it's not right. I know the best medicine is best is good nutrition. And in those early days, I was so mad or I, I was so frustrated at that at the fact that I'm in a hospital and the food that they're serving me is not healthy and it's not going to help anyone. Like it's just going to make things worse maybe, um, in my mind. So I want to create eventually, I want to create a, one of those meal plan type places, type companies that actually sends food to, to new trauma, trauma, um, patients so they can get the proper nutrients to possibly recover as much as they can in those early years, because those early, early months of an injury is the, is the time when you can probably get more of your mobility back. Mm -hmm. Um, they have those out, outpatient where, you know, 
they're, they're private companies where you pay $60 an hour to have a physical therapist keep stay on top of you. And you, you can't do that four, four times a week. You know what I mean? And getting only 1300 a month. Plus when I was put on Cobra, I was paying seven, 700 for insurance and only getting 13. I had to, I had to become homeless. The, you know, a year after my accident, I became homeless. Where'd you go when you were homeless? Well, I, I didn't want to be, like I said before, I don't want people giving me sympathy or like, oh man, do you need help? Are you okay? I didn't want to be that guy living in his car around San Diego because I just don't want to be that guy. So I made the choice, you know, basically I had a little small yard. So it's the size of a Prius. And I... um I hit the road. I, I used my jujitsu family across the country and I went from academy to academy and just at, because that was the physical therapy I needed. And I just hit, I decided to go on a, on a two year road trip into, um, uh, because Medicare doesn't give you insurance until you've been in your situation for two years. And you, so you, you go two years going from jujitsu gym to, other gyms and it's just crazy that's a that's a wild journey but man that had to have been pretty uh fulfilling at times too you know like you're getting all this information you're having relationships you know what i mean yeah well it's pay it it, it benefits me now because i have such a huge community across the across the united states uh, uh so it, it, now now that i'm my body has caught up with my mind i'm ready to unfold all these things i've been writing for all these years you don't just go to any gyms i mean you're at henzo's gym in new york city for people that don't know that's probably the peak of it you know in the states for uh brazilian jiu-jitsu you actually film videos with them you um film videos with other people you've been in um pretty significant competitions too super matches if you will and in those years that you've been doing this, you've built this name for yourself and you're well known in the community and you're well aired, meaning that it's not just on this podcast or other podcasts, you're all over and people get a chance to hear you and see you. And you built that, you built that journey from that, get in my car and go on this adventure, which is pretty wild after an injury to just be like, ah, I'm going to leave, um, I'm going to leave the doctors behind that I had the comfort zone. I know, and we're just going to go figure this out. Were you, were you scared? How'd you make that leap? No, it was, um, it, I, like I said, it was always for me, if it was a challenge or if it was, if it was any kind of like, ha ha, I'm going to break you with this one. I, I would laugh and say, no, let's do it then. Like, okay, you want to, you want to act like, I don't know who I'm talking to, but yeah, but usually I'm talking to the pain. So when I would feel any kind of pain, um, I would, I would clam up and then focus. So my, my, my realization in life is when you separate emotion from facts, it's so extremely easy. My belief is if you look in the past, uh, in your past, in your past, uh, in the past of your path, and if there is anything that is greater than what you're faced with now, then you can get through this. And if there's something that is, is even, and if you're going through something right now that just dwarfs any kind of pain or any kind of situation you've been in in the past, you look back to the worst one in the past and realize that you got through that one. So this you will get through as well. What resources did you use to develop a mindset like that? Uh, older brothers beating you up. <laughs> That's true, right? It's something that just stayed with me my entire life. And you know what's strange is I see the same characteristics in my younger brother uh, because I passed the torch to him from beating him up or picking on him. Whatever happened to me, I passed it down to him, obviously. So even he has the same uh, um pain resistance you know toughness to to them if you look at the jiu-jitsu world right now where do you see adaptive jiu-jitsu 10 years from now if you think about 
you know, podcasts like yours, getting more people on the mats, people in 10 years from now, these, these, if you, if you're listening and you start jujitsu today in 10 years from now, you're either going to, and you're, and you had a steady training, you're either going to be a brown belt, a, a late purple belt, a brown belt, or even a black belt, depending on how much time you put in, like in 10 years time, you could achieve that. So imagine if you had the whole population starting to train jujitsu in 10 years from now, you're going to have all these monsters on the mats. But more importantly, you're going to have all these monsters in different gyms. So what happens when I'm in my academy is I tap somebody and they're like, whoa, what would you do? Show me that. And then I show them and then they tap someone else with it. And then they're like, and then they show them and then I show them or I do a seminar in my own academy. And then so my academy in itself will learn the tricks and the unorthodox jujitsu that I'm doing. So imagine if every academy across the world had a one person that stuck it through and is a black belt in that academy with a limitation, their academy is going to know those techniques as well. So when you start seeing people using them in competition, using them in more, more uh, uh, situations where the light is shine on, shined on it, you will end up eliminating an offense and defense because you won't be safe anywhere. You know, does that make sense? It does make sense. So you talked a bit about how you plan to get in your van and go across the country visiting jujitsu schools, rehab centers, and so forth, getting the word out of what you can do. What excited me a lot about this is that you plan to outfit your van, man. What are you going to do with that van? Well, I lucked out because um, I, I was at a gas station getting gas. I asked a guy to, I wasn't feeling good, so I asked a guy passing by if he could tell the person to come out and pump, help me pump gas, please. And then when he came back, he's like, he told me he, he his father-in-law passed away, and he has he's been holding on to this van for years. Um, it's a 1998. Um, like one of those family cruiser vans has the bucket seats in the back, has the bed, that, the couch the bed that folds down, yep. you know, like, um, but the bucket seats aren't in there and there's actually a lift in there. The, the driver's seat actually, um, you press a button and it, it swings back so you can get off your and get out into your chair has hand controls. It was complete and it only has 48,000 miles on, but it's been sitting for years. Um, so before I, I before uh, I'm, I've been in construction also my whole life. So I, I had a contractor's license when I fell, and um, so I know how to build a house to change a light bulb. And uh, so my goal is to basically I'm going to cut the whole thing, rewire for electricity, put some solar on it, um, one of those RV ACs because I have a cat that that would be rolling with me. Yeah. And um, I want to take the drive, the passengers, the front passenger seat out, and then I'm going to build a whole kitchen in there, a uh, little kitchen nook in there. And um, the what's cool is I don't have a ramp; I have a lift. So when the lift comes down, if I'm outside of the van, the lift comes down like to a table height, so I can even grill out there if I need to, and because um, it's metal. Uh, so I plan to, but. But what's cool is I, instead of walls, I, I have this idea where I want to line the walls in canvas um, and then just paint scenes that I see all across the country. So it, it becomes more personalized or more of a museum kind of. <laughs> so you're a painter? Yeah, I get it. I, my, I didn't even know I was a painter. My, I was um, bit, So I got the divorce. A year later, my dad... Uh, got cancer and I spent the last 11 months with him and then a year after that I fell into my wheelchair so I was hit with these three things in a row but when my dad was uh, uh, going through chemo in those end and he wouldn't talk a lot and it was hard to get him to interact because he just felt like crappy and he was a painter so I would ask him questions on how, how would you paint this? Look what, look what we're looking at. How would you paint that? And then because it excited him to talk about it. So 
I didn't realize that I was learning how to paint from my dad's like just those conversations. And then uh, several months after he passed away, I picked up, I bought, I bought all this stuff for him to paint, but he was too weak to do it. So I ended up trying it myself and I was just surprised that I was able to do it. And then it's a hobby I ended up, I enjoyed doing. And um, it's really, I don't know. I'm still new, obviously, and I learn techniques as I go, but I guess I'm all right. No, that's awesome. I didn't know you were in that side of things, too. I mean, that's something that Caitlin Connor came on and she talked about it, too, about how important art and therapy was. And, you know, in her recovery, she lost her leg due to an auto accident amongst a bunch of other things. And she runs Be More Adaptive. And she talked about how art was integral. And she still sees it as integral. And she'll throw art online that has impacted her and stuff she works on herself. So it's pretty cool. Maybe you need to start an Instagram account just with your art, right? And throw it on both accounts so people have it. But it's cool. You have a bunch of stuff that you're thinking, you know, you're getting involved in. You have a bunch of stuff you're already doing. I look out there, there's a lot of people not feeling like they can do stuff, not feeling like they can th- can get going. After everything that's happened to you, you've learned a ton, man. I'm sure you've learned a ton. We're all learning as things happen to us. What has life taught you about everything, man? Well, I'd say the most um, in- impactful lesson that I learned was that you – that you, your situation, no matter how dramatic it is, it's really insignificant in, in comparison to, to um, the people, or my situation, I should say. It feels insignificant compared to, to people I met that, are, that can't even use their arms, that can't even, that stuck, that, you know, they're just laying there they're in a chair you and they have to move around with their mouth like they're enjoying life just you know obviously like you mentioned earlier we see the good i have some bad days i have bad i never get angry i get really frustrated but i learned that no matter how bad my situation can get there is someone that if you complain about your position and, and your situation, you're just doing a disjustice to those people who, who wish that they had your problems. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Totally. The only times that I really got choked up and started feeling a depression was about seven days, about eight, eight days after my accident. And I heard the guy in the next room yelling for the nurse and, I was getting choked up, looking at my legs, thinking, what did I do? Um, and at that, that moment, I hear this guy yelling, so I called a nurse for him, and then I went back to my woe is me world. And a few minutes later, I heard the nurse come in, and he was, like, angry, yelling, my nose itches, my nose itches, I dropped the thing. And I, at that moment, I was like, I can never complain ever about my situation, no matter how bad, no matter how much pain I feel, I can never, ever complain because he had a brand new baby too, and he couldn't even hold his child. Uh, so for me, that was an eye opener. Even, I, I mean, I'm glad that I got it so early in my injury uh, because I never looked back after that. So I think the most important thing I learned was um, actually, analyzing your situation without emotion and understanding that you know there's other people out there that are that are like i said just wishing they had your problems i i agree there is so much more significant things that can happen in life while we're still here and just appreciating what you got while you have it and adapting to how you have or what you have and moving forward Because there's a lot of outlets out there, man. There's a lot of people. There's a big community of people adapting and figuring shit out and leaning on each other and getting through it. So vital, so important. That's the whole purpose of this and and getting out and being part of that. Now, what's the best way to get out and learn more about you? Uh, My social media is the, is the best way to, to follow me. Um, But 
as far as following, if you're interested in jujitsu and you're not sure, maybe you're like, well, he has a spinal cord injury and I have this. I, co- I interview or we interview, Jen and I interview a lot of people across the world with different limitations that are, are already doing jujitsu. So that's why I started that magazine. Um, because I couldn't, uh, I, there's no way to explain what jujitsu is. So especially to someone that's limited, even doctors would tell me like, I don't know, you shouldn't be doing that. But you have to also understand that a lot of people associate your situation based off their own abilities. So like you get it all the time. It's kind of a selfish response. Like, when, oh, what happened to you? Oh, I fell off a balcony. Oh, I don't know what I would do if that happened to me. I'd probably kill myself. And I'm like, I'm like, you know how selfish it is, that is to say, like, you're just referring my situation to yours, you know. But but then again, you can't get mad because it's only nature. I was I was that I was that person. I'm sure. You know what I mean? I'm not going to all of a sudden fall in a wheelchair and say I never parked in a handicapped spot or used the, the, the nice roomy stall. So, you know, and then some people say, well, oh, I, I busted out my knee, but it doesn't compare to you. And I'm like, no, it does. You, you're, if you're immobilized and your life has changed dramatically, that's your spinal cord injury. You don't have to have a broken spine for it to affect you in life. Like just, you know, like that's like you comparing your life to, to my spinal cord injury. You go through your own world of, of uh, situations and issues. You know what I mean? I agree. Uh, but just because you're not in a wheelchair doesn't mean that mine is more is worse than yours and I should get more attention. And absolutely not. You know, so I also try to give that message to people where don't ever compare your situation to another, especially in a in a wheelchair, because uh, my my really good friend, Brian or or, or Pete, you, I think you you uh, interviewed Pete. Yeah, I've hung with Pete. He's an awesome guy. Pete McGregor. They, more mobility than me they have maybe less pain than me uh-huh. uh, you know what i mean but i'm not gonna sit there and be like oh why did my injury be at this point you know they they have better life brian gets to drive a car without without hand controls like i'm not gonna sit there and complain about that stuff that's them and i'm me and you have to look at your situation like realistically you cannot bring emotion into it because once you do you fall into a rabbit hole that just—it's hard to get out of. Yeah, I yeah, I get that. I get though the the comparison. You just can't get in that realm of comparing all the time. You know, you just really can't. So, well, can- more importantly, you cannot not ever compare yourself to the person you were before, because you will torture yourself. Like you have to understand that you we had the opportunity. Um, Uh, And this is something you can't relate to, but I have the opportunity to live two different lives. So I lived up to 34, walking, being adventurous. I didn't waste my time. So people who are listening that aren't, that don't even have any, any limitations, I didn't waste my time. Don't waste, don't wait till something dramatic happens to start doing something with your life. Like if you want to be a traveler, you start putting money away and you start your traveling. I was a rock climber. I did parkour. I did um, jujitsu. Uh, I learned how to cook most amazing meals. Um, like I'm a graphic designer, uh, a carpenter for my whole life, then a general contractor. I, um, you know what I mean? I didn't sit there and say like, well, I don't have any skills and just go on with life. Like I s- looked for everything like if there was something i can do and i wanted to learn and it it sparked my interest i didn't just say like oh that would be cool to learn i did it i tried i skate skateboarding i did everything i could in my life so i lived an amazing fulfilled life and then now i'm in a wheelchair and that's just a reset i get the opportunity to live the same type of life but now from a wheelchair, it's a different world. It's all brand new and I have to build myself up. But let me ask you, let me put it in simple perspective. If it's going to take you a year to learn the basics of a sport um, and that year is going to be rough and tough and you're going to feel a lot of pain in your intercostal muscles because you don't have a core and 
and your arms wear out fast and whatever the situations, the everyday struggle. And then after that year is over, everything gets easier. And now you, you have you have a good skill base and so on. And then you lived for the next 40 years. How significant was that one year of taking off? into your whole lifestyle, into your whole lifetime. It's so minute. So don't think about it as, oh, it's going to take this long to to get to a certain level. Like, just think about it like, I'm going to put the time in, and then in the long run, it's going to be worth it. Because it, you cannot, you can't put time on anything. Because I was working and had all... I was training jiu-jitsu every, every, all the, as much as I can, going to school, working. And then I fell on a Saturday and come Monday, I didn't have a job because I couldn't even walk. I couldn't even, I was in the hospital. You know what I mean? So you can't, now that doesn't mean be reckless with your life and be like, well, I, I should pay rent or have fun. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, don't, ha- don't go, yeah, rent. pay that rent, man. You Unless gotta- it's something once in a lifetime, because you will ba- bounce back from the rent. Unless it, if as long as no one else is re, is re, um, is relying on you. So where are you going from here, man? Well, I have to get out of Florida first. So um, one thing I never wanted to ask for help. Uh, I had a, I had a goal ever since I was early on in my injury. I think the first year I made a goal. I was like, okay, I want to get a an actual van with the lift, everything, or a ramp um, before I even ask anybody for help because I know it's going to take time to to build this, to build my body up, to be able to do what I this dream that I wrote, I, I just designed or I just came up with. So my goal was to get a van. Now I got the van, um, but the van needs, since it's been sitting so long, it needs some help. So I'm, I have to get that sorted out first, and after that, um, once, once I can finish, then I'm going to do, uh, some adventures here in my, in Florida, so Southern Florida, and then work my way up. And then my goal is to hit every, every state in the country, um, just visiting rehab centers, visiting jujitsu academies, visiting people. If you're, if you're like, Hey, you're coming to North Carolina, I live here. It would be great to, to see you or great to meet you. If it's in my path, I have, I have nothing to do but meet people, and that's my goal. So I really enjoy meeting people and just talking and hearing stories. I never try to uh, – I never put myself above anyone, and I'm always open. Like I know some people may feel like it's hard to uh, talk to people, uh, but I'm – like I said, I'm open book. Whatever you – you have any questions, if you were like, I'm new to my spinal cord injury – what happened at this time? Like I, I've been writing everything and documenting everything since my first week. My friend Vicky, I told you about, she came in. Um, when she came in to get the keys, she came in with a, like five or six composite notebooks and pencils and was like, write it all down. And I, ever since then, I've been writing my journey down because you tend to forget where you were. Um, uh, so when I go and meet somebody that's been in the, spinal cord injury for two months i i try to go back in my notes at my two month area and i see where my mindset was uh because first you have to know how to talk to them because i was shutting everyone down especially if you were in a wheelchair i didn't want to hear from you i didn't care i didn't want to um i didn't want to learn from other people that already been through it i was very um stubborn i was like no i'm gonna figure it out on my own like i feel bad because the 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 social worker at the the um, hospital, she was in a wheelchair and she was telling me about how I should get the brakes that fold under my chair. And because she told me that, I got the other ones because I didn't want to help anyone's help. Um, it wasn't anything against her in the wheelchair. It was just, I just had the understanding that my injury could be different from others. So I don't want, I didn't want to be misled either. So I just wanted to figure it out on my own. And that was part of my um, part of my struggle in the beginning. Uh, uh, so I don't recommend that to anybody who's thinking that way right now. Like get get help, 
you're not, you're, no one's going to be thinking less of you, like, and no one's going to care. Get those writings into a book. Let us read it, man. Oh, I'm working on it. I, I'm actually, um, after I do this road trip, my next plan after the road trip is to take three months out of, out of the year um, and just like maybe go to a farm in Brazil and just write or go because I'm living in a van. I don't, I don't have um, any roots, basically. Um, so I'll go to, I can go anywhere in the world. Something somewhere peaceful and nice. I have friends all over the world, so um, my plan is to go three months somewhere and just work on my book. If you're uh, trying to write your own book, if you're listening, I don't recommend staying in those dark days for more than three months at a time uh, because you, you you could relive them. Yeah, I I when you're saying that, it kind of man, it really hit home. You know, that is a huge journey you went on. If you think of like where you started all those years ago in Virginia, Northern Virginia, DC metro area to now um, and where your path is, what a dramatic difference. What a way to look back and be like, wow, so much has happened. So much positive has happened too. Yeah, I, I wouldn't change my life though. If you asked me like, would you go back to that that balcony and uh, not sit on that ledge, and, and absolutely not. One, because that was me. If it was dangerous, I wanted to do it. Like if it had any, if you were like, no, that's dangerous. Like, really? Like that's how I. That's how my brain works. So that. So I wouldn't be depriving who I am. And then on top of it, um, yeah, I lived a great life, and I was very adventurous, mountain bike and everything, but. I'm doing so much more for others now that, and it's more fulfilling to help others than it is to, to help yourself. It, I think about it sometimes and what you just said, it's like, you don't realize, man, the, the path you go through until you look back and you're like, whoa, like you're right. Like this kid staring down, I was in fifth grade, I think, staring down the huge flight of steps on the back, on the back porch. And then just like getting the nerve up, getting the nerve up because my one of my favorite TV shows was The Fall Guy. So I I would just I would wanted to be a stunt man basically. And That's I remember so awesome. <laughs> I was staring down the flight of steps, like wanted to like, oh I practiced halfway and it wasn't so bad. There was a little slope at the end. I was like, my theory, this was before parkour. My theory was if I jump. I'm going to roll down the stairs uh, or roll down the hill uh, forward uh, because that's what happened from midway up. And then at the top, I finally I finally launched, launched off those stairs. And that was the most pain. That was the first time I felt what real pain was like. I didn't have common sense or I, I, I don't or I didn't or I threw it in the wind, I guess, like because what I saw in movies. And, you know, my brother, my older brother has me an iron sheet pulling my chin, like <laughs> basically cracking my back. And he doesn't know it's fake. <laughs> so we used to do that all the time in the backyard. We'd like, um, yeah. we, it was WWF then. And we would just beat the shit out of each other in the backyard. We would, um, I remember my brothers would jump off the roof of the house into bushes like little bushes they just didn't give a shit there was just like this era that we grew up in where people just caution just didn't exist it, it was just ridiculous it was fun though but yeah th i got messed up i used to hang from the second floor window when i was in fifth in the same around the same time i used to hang from that second floor window waiting for cars to come by and then fall <laughs> Just so they would think I fell out a window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were, yeah. But you're in the 80s. No one gives a shit. They just kept trying. Yeah, I remember we'd like try to get past a car if it was going. This is how stupid we were. Like a car would be like flying down the road and we're like, here it comes. And you try to run in front of it and see if it wouldn't hit you, but like have to stop. Would it stop first? So you like, you'd like cut it off, but keep running past. You wouldn't actually stop or play chicken with it. Just stupid stuff like that. 
They're just so dumb. We were just such dumb kids. But I mean, I don't think I've changed much in my personality in a lot of ways. I just don't do it as much physically. You know, the recklessness. The recklessness was awesome. It was so fun. And I appreciate that era. I'm glad it's not existing for the era my kids are in, though. Yeah. I I, I wish that the kids played with more dirt nowadays. Yeah, for sure. But at least get out there and get dirty. Well, Max, I appreciate you coming on, man. I hope people get on the mats because of you. Jiu-Jitsu is fun as shit. I like it more than CrossFit and anything else out there. It's a lot of fun. It, it builds a lot of functionality, and I just I just really enjoy it, and I hope you're that gateway to get them in. I appreciate you coming on. I hope so. And if anyone, like I said, don't don't even feel, don't hesitate to, to call or reach out if you want to find an academy. I'll help you find an academy. All right, that's the episode. Remember, you can find contact information for guests in the show notes or on our website, livingadaptive.com. On livingadaptive.com, you can also find previous episodes, writings, and a bunch of other good stuff. So go there. Peace.